Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is Grace O'Malley, the Pirate Queen. Grace O'Malley, or Grainne Whale, is an iconic name in Irish history. She's been called many things over the centuries. An Irish chieftain, a Pirate Queen, or Queen of the West. But in today's show, we get behind these titles to look at the story behind the real historical figure. Grace emerged as a fearsome leader in a violent, patriarchal world of lethal power politics in the west of Ireland in the 16th century. In this podcast, her biographer, Anne Chambers, talks us through the fascinating twists and turns of Grace's life, all the way from her early years in the west of Ireland through to meeting Queen Elizabeth I in London. I have links to Anne's website and her biography of Grace in the show notes below. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, Check out the shop because we have a beautiful enamel pin of Grace O'Malley in stock at the moment. I have a link to it in the show notes below as well, but you can find it at irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash shop. Since I released the last episode in the War of Independence series, I had my first visit back to the National Archives in ages and it was fantastic. It was really great to get stuck back into new research again. At the moment, I'm working on two new series. The first of these is actually something I've been working on and off on for years. It looks at daily life in Ireland before the famine through the lens of one of the most bizarre murders of the age. Now this is a story that's never been published anywhere else save a brief episode I made several years ago but I have continued researching the story and uncovered huge amounts of detail in the archives. Now that's in the final stages at the moment and hopefully I'll have it to you in about the next six weeks. The second series in the pipeline is another previously unpublished chapter from our history, but this one is more modern. This series, which is still in the early stages, looks at a forgotten story from the 1970s. Now, like all my work, this new research is funded by listeners to the show. While podcasts are free, I think you'll appreciate that making shows based on fresh research incurs lots of time and costs. Making series like these based on new research is only possible because of the support of listeners like you. If you want to support the show, it costs the price of a pint or two a month, but that makes all the difference to me in helping with this research. Now you can support my research and the history you want to hear on Patreon and Acast Plus today. Signing up is straightforward at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast or Acast Plus. Again, there's links in the show notes below. As well as supporting the history you want to hear, you get lots of perks by signing up and becoming a supporter like ad-free content and bonus shows. Now to today's episode. Sound was by Jason Looney. I began my conversation with Anne by asking her to give me a sense of the Ireland that Grace O'Malley was born in. As you're about to hear, it was a radically different place. People like Grace understood the world around them in very different terms than we do today. Well, Grace O'Malley was born into an Ireland that really is very, very uh, different from later generations of historians' perception of what happened afterwards. She was born in 1530, and at the start of her life, really, Ireland had returned almost to its its Gaelic roots after the uh, invasion of the Normans in the 12th century. In the succeeding centuries, Ireland had gone Gaelic again with a little area from Dublin and the area around it known as the Pale. So Grace O'Malley was very much born into an Ireland that was divided into around 60 different lordships ruled by Gaelic, native Gaelic chieftains and the Gaelicized, should I say, Anglo-Normans, such as the great houses of the Desmonds in in Munster and indeed the clan records in Connacht. That life was very, very different. Uh, At the end of her life in 1603, that unique Gaelic life was totally undermined and swept away. So Grace O'Malley's life was spent, which I think was in seven decades of what was the most traumatic and upheaval and change in Irish history. So consequently, her life, I had to examine her personal life set against that huge period of change and upheaval. Anne next went on to explain Grace's early life. 
The only factual evidence to Grace O'Malley's life is contained, would you believe, in the English state papers. The Irish historians, uh, for reasons which we may talk about later on, choose to airbrush her out from history because really she didn't represent what later generations of historians wanted to portray as Irish womanhood. So at the start of her life, she was the daughter, uh, she was an aristocratic she was the daughter of the chieftain, the chieftain of the O'Malley clan. Now, the O'Malley clan were very different to the 80 other clans that uh, inhabited this island. And what made them stand apart from everything else was seafaring. If you go back into the annals 2,000 years beforehand, the O'Malley's are always associated with sea trading, a little bit of plundering and piracy on the side, which was part and parcel of maritime life everywhere from Cornwall to the South China Seas to the west coast of Ireland. So Grace O'Malley was brought up a very different type of chieftain. So consequently, seafaring was in her DNA. If Grace O'Malley hadn't had been a boy, for example, I wouldn't have bothered writing her biography. She would simply have been another O'Malley doing what came naturally for 2000 years. But because she was a woman, and she says it herself in her, in her letters that I found in the state papers, she says herself that she was trained very young in seafaring. She had that urge to go seafaring that really uh, overcame her, her being a female. Now, life on the sea for a female, as you know, there were superstitions. Uh, women on, on, by sea were looked on as the devil's ballast. There were huge superstitions uh, that they would bring squalls and uh, storms if there was a female on board ship. So all of these things as a young child, Grace O'Malley overcame by the sheer ability and connection she had made with the sea. Her, her education was concerned, as is very um, evident from her correspondence and indeed from people who met her. As we're about to hear... Grace O'Malley was educated, which was pretty unusual at the time. However, while she would go on to challenge the stereotypes and norms of the age, initially it seemed her life would follow a similar path to other women of the time. Grace O'Malley was possibly received her education with the Augustinians in the Murisk Abbey that had been founded by her forefathers. So consequently, you have a young woman here that has already stepped over the boundaries that were looked on as male uh, preserve. And she also is educated. But being the daughter of a chieftain, she also had another function to perform. And that was that she had to marry whoever her, her parents and the clan deemed right for her. So at the young age, which was normal at the time of 15 years of age, Grace O'Malley was married. And I choose these words very carefully. She was married uh, to a chieftain of the O'Flaherty's, a neighbouring clan that ruled, roughly speaking, all of Connemara as we know it today. Donal on Coggy Flaherty give, is a giveaway to what he was like. Donal of the Battles of Flaherty, given to, as sadly most of the chieftains were given, and indeed the English would take great advantage of that by a divide and conquer policy there pursued in Ireland later on, um, he was given to warfare. This, this, this is a tribal society where you're more, uh, you're only, uh, I suppose, your only vista is your own clan, your own property, your own, um, um, I suppose, treasure, which happened to be cattle. Cattle herds were the, the treasure of the Gaelic Irish. And beyond that, you didn't see a wider Ireland. So everything was to do with your own territory and your own uh, people and your own followers and your own property. So consequently, being married off at a young age, she was married into this O'Flaherty um, clan. Now, Donald was the chieftain-elect, the Tarnishta, to succeed to the overall chieftaincy of the O'Flaherty. So it was a very, very good marriage for Grace O'Malley to make in terms of where everybody presumed her life would be as a matri as as a woman living under the shadow of her husband, but that, as you know, was not the way it turned out, because that marriage really, um, really, after the birth of three of three children, she had two sons and a daughter with Donal O'Flaherty, and Donal O'Flaherty got caught up in yet another tribal dispute, this time with the Joyces, and. 
It was then that Grace O'Malley comes out when he was killed in that warring uh, tribal feud with the Joyces over indeed the possession of the castle on Loch Carver. The death of her husband had huge consequences for Grace. She returned to her father's lands after the death of Donal as a young widow with three young children. And she tells us later in life, when she's um, in her in her correspondence, that the O'Flaherty's refused to return her, her dowry. Now, dowries were protected, protected by the old Gaelic law, the old Brehan law. And you can see the reason why Grace O'Malley now had to return to her father's uh, territory. And that is the second stage of her life when she returns as a young widow and sets up her house on Clare Island. Uh, off the coast of County Mayo. It was at this point where the Grace O'Malley of myth and legend starts to emerge. I asked Anne about Grace's reputation as a pirate queen and what the actual history behind this was. Well, my 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 job as a biographer, Finn, as you know, is to get behind the monikers like the pirate queen. I'm interested in the woman. Here you have a young widow with three dependent children. What her dowry denied to her? What is her future? She goes back to Clare Island and she sets up as an independent leader. Now, that's very, very easy to say. The brain law, while they were very good in men and very liberal to women in many respects, indeed, I found that Grace O'Malley actually inherited land from her own mother. And when you think of the common law of England, if we can just talk about that for a moment, where a woman on marriage not only becomes the chattel of her husband, but also her, her property becomes the chattel of her husband. That wasn't the same in the more liberal Grehan law. And Grace O'Malley herself, as I said, inherited lands from her own mother. So very, very interesting, um, um, you know, change between uh, both laws. But when she went there, she had to firstly prove her worth. Now, it was a very male-dominated society. A woman could not become a chieftain by law. That was, you'd have to go back 2,000 years to get the warrior women chieftains then. Christianity and the and the Roman law that accompanied it um, got rid of all of that. So women were looked on really as childbearers and doers of charitable good works. That would be the highlight of their uh, expected careers. Where Somali set herself up. Now, when you say that, is she's up against the law. And most importantly, if she's setting herself up as a mariner, a seafarer, she's up against the most powerful, I suppose, thing in nature, and that was the sea. So you have her there as a young person, a young woman, and she manages to get together 200 men from various clans. Now, we we just mentioned there about the intertribal warfare that was constantly going on uh, among the Gaelic Irish, that this woman could manage to take men from the various clans in the area and mold them into an army that remained loyal to her until the last years of her life. When indeed in, in her late 60s, she's recorded in the state papers of leading an attack on the island of Barra off the coast of Scotland. I asked Anne more about this. It seemed an extraordinary thing to do in such a male-dominated world. Throughout her, her, her career, this woman managed to retain the, the loyalty of this diverse army of men, both by land and by sea. And, you know, it's, it's, it's somebody special who can do that. Firstly, she had to be successful. You don't, men would not follow anybody who was not successful by sea. And how was she successful? Well, what was her trade by sea? Her trade by sea was, as the O'Malley's had done for years, trading the clan produce, which was, as most clans at the time, were cattle hides and and uh, where the O'Malley's were concerned, salted fish was a very, very big market for them. Bringing in the gallo glass, the Scottish mercenaries, which the O'Malley's brought in every year for the fighting season, which usually stretched from May to October. So they were very, very um, familiar with that dangerous coastline all along Ulster, over across into the Isles uh, of Scotland. And Grace O'Malley continued that, and also a little bit of plundering and piracy on the side. We hear of her attacks, for example, down in Thomond, 
And the only time in her life she was captured was by the Earl of Desmond when she came upon uh, onto his lands, took some cattle and was captured and indeed was interned in Askeaton Castle in County Limerick for six months until the Earl, whose own loyalty to to Elizabeth at the time was under a big, a big question mark, handed her over as a sop to the English Munster uh, governor. And she was taken from there and put into Dublin Castle. And as you know, only the very most important political prisoners were ever put into Dublin Castle. And secondly, nobody, no political prisoner very rarely uh, managed to escape with Grace or, or to get, get out. But Grace O'Malley did because uh, her, her second husband had gone into rebellion. So she was sent to keep him, to bring him to heel. There is one little item I found in the state papers that perhaps better than I can, can show you what how Grace O'Malley had emerged in middle age. Uh, and it's a lovely pen picture offer that is given by Sir Henry Sidney, the Lord Deputy of Ireland in 1577. And he says, there came to me a most famous feminine sea captain called Grace O'Malley famous for her stoutness of courage and person. She led an army of three galleys and 200 fighting men. And listen to this. She brought with her her husband, for she was as well by land as by sea, well more than Mrs. Mate with him. This was the most notorious woman in all the coasts of Ireland. Now, I don't think even uh, certainly a biographer or even a fiction writer could not really put that beautiful pen picture of Grace and Mary together. And there she is in the state papers. And indeed, that was the very first entry I found in the state papers about Grace O'Malley. And it really, you know, it really encouraged me to complete her biography. The defining event of Grace's life was the Tudor reconquest of Ireland. This saw widespread conflict across most of Ireland as the English crown reasserted its authority in Ireland after centuries of decline. Grace's role in this is not what we might expect. We always like our heroines and heroes to be, I suppose, nationalistic, patriotic and usually Roman Catholic for Ireland. In the case of Grace O'Malley and her time, that simply did not matter. There was no national flag for which Grace O'Malley could follow or indeed any other leader or chieftain in Ireland during the most part of the 16th century. To the very end of the century, O'Neill and O'Donnell, through the Confederacy, managed, were trying, but it came too little too late. The English took advantage of that. Where Grace O'Malley was concerned, she was really a pragmatist. And you had to be in order to survive. If you had to up, uh, survive this upheaval. And what was this upheaval? Well, you know, the 16th century is the great age of exploration and discovery. And with discovery also comes exploitation. Uh, Ireland was being looked at through the middle of Grace O'Malley's life uh, by Queen Elizabeth I, and with good reason, as a backdoor to as the unguarded backdoor to England's international enemies. And as we know, the Spanish made many attempts to try and come in through Ireland to get at England. Secondly, it was, as I said, the, the age of discovery. How easy was it for the administrators and military men just to hop over the Irish Sea rather than taking on the challenge of America to the new worlds to get estates and lands for themselves. If a Gaelic chieftain could be forced into rebellion against the England, then his lands were confiscated. We saw what happened in Munster when the great Earl of Desmond went into rebellion. Almost 500,000 acres of land were given out to people like Sir Walter Raleigh, Edmund Spencer and the like, people who served in the Irish service. The same thing happened later in Connacht. And with the arrival of a governor called Sir Richard Bingham, Grace O'Malley personally became involved. Bingham seemed to hate Grace O'Malley, not for the reason that he was just she was Irish, but the fact she was a woman. And he really couldn't come to terms at all with having to even negotiate with her. Three times Grace O'Malley led a rebellion, not against the English, but individually against the English governor of Connacht. 
Again, there's no great national identity for which Grace O'Malley can ally to. There is no national flag. Nobody is fighting for Ireland. Everybody, every chieftain is fighting for his own survival. And if he isn't fighting, he's doing deals. And Grace O'Malley was a great deal maker. And you can see that in her correspondence with the English court. The Machiavellian world of Elizabethan English, England, uh, Grace O'Malley managed to uh, subvent and subvert and to get there herself. Three times she led, as I said, rebellions against Bingham. He managed to capture her and she was, as she says herself, a, a gallows was erected for her where she thought she might end her days. But such was her importance as a leader in Connacht at the time that the chieftains of Connacht came together, gave hostages in order to effect her release because they needed her. This conflict with Bingham intensified with huge personal consequences for Grace. As Bingham went further and further and with the Spanish Armada coming uh, crashing onto the shores of Connacht, he uh, upped the ante against Grace O'Malley, particularly because of her seafaring ability and the fact that he was afraid that the Spanish would make common cause with the Irish and, and go into rebellion against him. So all of this impacted on Grace O'Malley in, in a very personal way. First of all, uh, Bingham's brother, Captain John Bingham, killed her, her eldest son in Connemara, on Ome Island in Connemara. And she talks herself as a mother, having to count 12 stab wounds on the body of her eldest son. When her second son, Mirko Flaherty, decided to save his skin to ally with Bingham, she manned out her navy of galleys against her own son in Ballycanely in Connemara, attacked his castle, and made sure that he never allied with Bingham again. And actually, that is one incident then in her life that Queen Elizabeth, in her letter coming out from their meeting later in 1593, she was absolutely amazed at this chastisement that this mother would make on her own son. To come back to Bingham, the, the third thing he did against Grace O'Malley was, in 1592, he captured her most beloved son, Tibbet Nalong, Toby off the ships, the, the son by Richard Burke, her second husband, who, as is said, and indeed I found evidence to, to prove that, she was born aboard her ship on the high seas. And Tibbet was captured by Bingham because he was being accused of being in contact with O'Neill and O'Donnell in, in Ulster. He was incarcerated in Athlone Castle on the trumped-up charge of treason, which, as you know, was punishable by death. That is the reason in May 1593 that Grace O'Malley set off in the most perilous voyage of her entire life as a mother trying to save the life of her son, nobody to appeal to in Ireland, Bingham wouldn't even meet her, uh, so she goes, where does she go? She goes to his boss, Queen Elizabeth I, where they meet in 1593 in Greenwich Palace. The meeting between Grace O'Malley and Queen Elizabeth I is remarkable for lots of reasons, as we're about to hear. But Anne first explains the background to this meeting. Grace O'Malley simply couldn't walk into the Royal Palace in London, as she now explains. Well, it's very easy to say, you know, uh, that Grace O'Malley went over to meet Queen Elizabeth. Now, if you wanted to meet Queen Elizabeth II today, you'd have to go through all the <laughs> all the various diplomatic channels and possibly you possibly wouldn't get there. So how come a, a, a woman with a long list of, an in inverted commas, disloyal activities registered against her by Bingham and others in the military service in Ireland at the time? She's called, for example, nurse to all rebellions in Ireland, Bingham calls her. Um, a notable traitoress, another one calls her. Another one calls her a director of murders and thieves at sea. So with all of these and leading the three rebellions against uh, Bingham in Connacht, all these disloyal activities are there. Grace O'Malley doesn't go willy-nilly uh, sailing off into the blue over to Greenwich. She knows very well that the uh, fate meted out to pirates, if you're caught, uh, and she could, she would have seen it indeed as she sailed up the Thames, was that your body was hung in an iron cage over the Thames where the birds of the air literally picked you clean. 
uh, and you died in that terrible way. That was the fate of pirates at the time. The fate of rebels was being hung, drawn and quartered. Grace O'Malley did not go willy-nilly to the court of Elizabeth. She knew the politics of the time. Firstly, she got in contact with Black Tom, the 10th Earl of Ormond, a cousin of Queen Elizabeth to Anne Boleyn, her mother. The butlers were, were connected to the Boleyn family. And he was a favourite of Queen Elizabeth at her court at the time, dashing and good looking as Elizabeth liked her courtiers to be, her male courtiers to be. And Grace O'Malley went down to Ormond Castle in Carrigan Shore. And there she got, which I found in the state papers, a letter of introduction to Lord Burley, the, uh, Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth's loyal and longtime Secretary of State, the famous William Cecil Lord Burley. And I found the letter of introduction. That also was a letter of protection for her, because if she was in, uh, intercepted on her voyage there, she could always show the letter to whoever wished to imprison her or detain her, that she had this letter of introduction. She sailed for uh, London about the time of May 1593 with the sole object to get her son, Tibbet Nalong, released uh, and to keep Bingham away from the rest of her family. She is around London during the summer of 1593, and there was a plague Indeed, we think COVID is so unique. Uh, they suffered all of these in, in past times, as you know. And there was actually a plague in London at the time. And the, the court of Elizabeth had moved down to Greenwich. And Grace O'Malley followed it. And one of the highlights of my research was to go up the same steps that are still there today, even though Greenwich Palace is gone, the Royal Maritime Museum is there and the observatory and all these places. And to walk up these same, the landing stairs is still there that it was in the 16th century. And there she was hanging about the court like hundreds of other uh, petitioners who wanted to gain the Queen's ear. And she was there for a number of weeks. And it's very, very interesting what happened. She made great friends with Lord Burley. And I found one of her letters to him. And this most powerful man in Europe at the time had actually doodled on the side of her letter, her pedigree, trying to work out her, her descent and her uh, two marriages, one to O'Flaherty, one to Burke, and where Tibbet Nalong came in from all of that. It was a very interesting and a lovely little kind of personal pen picture of this famous uh, Elizabethan uh, administrator uh, doing this maybe at nighttime with all the thousands of missives that have been coming in from international spies all around Europe that he actually sat down and tried to work out Grace O'Malley's uh, genealogy. Uh, it's quite amazing. Anne now explains what happened when the two women, Grace O'Malley and Queen Elizabeth I, met. In July 1593, she was accorded a meeting with Elizabeth. And one of the highlights of the research was to find the letter that Elizabeth wrote, both confirming that meeting that folklore had always kept alive when historians ignored it. Folklore had kept that uh, meeting alive, exaggerated it a little bit by saying the great Queen of the West had come banging on the door of Greenwich, you know, and demanded to see the Queen. Not at all. Both of them were elderly women by then. 63 years of age in the 16th century was like 93 today. Both women had broken through the boundaries of what was meant to have been a male preserve. Elizabeth had held on to her power against all the odds and against all the attempts to kill her during that time and uh, uh, unseat her. Grace O'Malley had managed to survive not only the awful upheaval that uh, Elizabeth's own military men were uh, causing to her and her family, but also had survived the wild and tempestuous uh, um, lifetime on the Atlantic Ocean. And I think from that letter shows that both women saw in one another a sister spirit, you know. Uh, Elizabeth says in her letter, she orders Bingham to have pity on this poor aged woman who, who came before me. Now, Elizabeth was the same age and there was only one difference between them. And that was a layer of makeup, perhaps, on the part of Queen Elizabeth. And she 
tells Bingham, orders Bingham to restore Grace O'Malley's family to their lands, to release Tibbet along from, from jail in Athlone, which he did, indeed he did. And funny enough, Grace O'Malley returns, which isn't very well known, a second time in 1595, when, because Bingham dragged his, his feet about implementing the Queen's orders. And it is Burley this time she sees. And it's very interesting to note that Bingham was recalled from military service in Ireland shortly after that. So perhaps Grace O'Malley got her final wish with Bingham um, um, recalled from duty in Ireland. And indeed, he ended up in the in the Tower of London. So, I mean, there was a, 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 another side to uh, Bingham's life as well. Uh, but he was Grace O'Malley's, I suppose, greatest obstacle in Ireland that she ever encountered. But that really was the significance of you know, her meeting with Queen Elizabeth was, I suppose, a really extraordinary event in many respects, uh, you know, given her background, given her so-called disloyal activities. Uh, but there was something there that gelled between the two women. And it is very evident, as I say, from uh, Queen Elizabeth's letter, which indeed I have reproduced in the biography, because I think it really does show a lot more than any biographer could even uh, hope to, to say. Finally, I wanted to ask Anne about the legacy of Grace O'Malley today because she has become a larger-than-life figure over the centuries. Grace O'Malley herself faded out from history. We know that she died in Carrigahawley, Rothley Castle, uh, uh, a minor castle of her second husband, Richard Burke, the MacWilliam of Mayo, and she died there around the year 1603. Buried perhaps on Clare Island in the lovely abbey there where her tomb is often pointed out. Uh, um, how she came, she's still mentioned by the English and the state papers right up to 1624, whereas the Irish historians, including the annals of the four masters that were created just uh, up the coast from where she lived, and were being written really just after she died. They don't even mention her. Indeed, the an added insult as the editor uh, adds her on as a footnote to her husband's castle, which I thought was a very, very dismissive altogether. How she has evolved over the centuries is very interesting. She's become a symbolic name for the Irish struggle for independence. And she also has become this fearsome Caribbean type pirate, you know, the pirate queen. And we all use that, Grania Whale, she was bald. No, no, she wasn't. The name Grania Whale comes from the O'Malley name, Melia, which indeed O'Malley's everywhere today, and many of them are called Melias, and Grania Male became Grania Bald, which is untrue. What I like to think about that is that at least it kept her memory alive uh, until someone like me comes along and I'm from Mayo and I went on holidays to the areas always as a child, most associated uh, around Clue Bay. And I used to hear these folk tales about her. But yet when I went to school, I heard about Queen Elizabeth I and I read about her at school, but I never read about Grace O'Malley. So that's really what set me out was her absence in my school history books. And I have to say today, even yesterday, I got I got queries from students who are, uh, are who are learning and doing projects on her from where did I get them? Utah, Cheshire and Clifton. Grace O'Malley has at last been restored to history. People know the facts about her. She can uh, inspire, I think. There's a great, she's broken the boundaries for women, and she certainly has become an iconic example. If I'm to go by all the women's groups around the world who contact me every single year about how inspirational she is, not in any a silly kind of way associated with piracy, but for them themselves to be able to grow and develop their own abilities. As I'm getting on, I see also that she's a great icon for positive aging. You know, I told you I found reference to the fact that at the great age of 63, which was like 93 today, she's up 
uh, plundering on a retaliatory raid on MacNeil of Barra up on the island of Scotland. She's remaining active to the very, very end of her life. And as that, she's a positive icon for, uh, for ageism in females. So you have all of that. Myself, at the moment, I'm involved as we speak. I've written a screenplay for um, um, a, a television series based as closely as we can on her uh, biographical life. We, um, um, I'm very, very happy to say that Kirsten Church and the Oscar-winning Irish uh, director has taken the rights and she, I've turned down so many over the years for the simple reason they want to make pirates of the Atlantic Ocean, you know, and it would be a great... Um, insult almost to Grace Omani and what she means to go behind as I said at the beginning, go behind find the woman behind the Pirate Queen and you'll find the motivation for Grace Omani as a woman as a daughter, as a wife twice over, as a widow as a lover uh, as, a, as a mother of four children, as a grandmother and great grandmother and matriarch you see she fills every female role in, in uh, that is available so I think from that respect, she will continue to, um, her memory will, I think, guaranteed now to not only survive, but also I think she will be taken a little bit more seriously than she was as a really a, a very, very interesting historical icon. I want to thank Anne for her time. You can find links to her book and the website in the show notes below. If you want to support the show, you can also follow the links to Acast Plus and Patreon. Until next time, slong.